Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Mara McLaughlin, Director of IRL Social Skills, here with Coach Sebastian. Sebastian, will you introduce yourself, please? Yes, my name is Sebastian, and I'm an autistic self-advocate, direct support professional for autistic teenagers, and I'm a social coach with IRL Social Skills. So our class schedule, this is a little sample class that we are offering right now. And so this is what our schedule, you know, looks like for the purposes of this and of this video. So I just invite you to ask yourself these questions. What brought you here today? And just notice what is happening in your body, not so much your mind, but what is happening in your body as you ask yourself these questions and what are you expecting to learn? Just noticing what it's like to be here right now doing this. So these are the participation guidelines for our class. You want to um, raise your hand using the hand emoji that you'll see at the bottom of the screen on Zoom. And you can use the chat feature. Um, stay on topic in the chat. We love emojis, so use emojis. And just be present to this right now, like no multitasking. And take care of your own body. Move, stretch, get up, walk around, have a snack as you like. So the double empathy problem is a theory that was brought up by um, Dr. Damian Milton. He came up with this to just outline that both people with shared experiences, okay, communicate effectively through a shared empathy. People with a different experience have divergent empathies and have different communication skills due to a double empathy problem. This disproportionately impacts those in the neuro minority because they are in the minority. We know that autistic people are not socially deficient, but are instead victims of the double empathy problem and perception bias. As autistic people are significantly outnumbered, they are perceived as socially deficient. We also know that those in the neuro majority Allistics or neurotypicals have challenges with communication and getting along all the time. So this is where we come to the both and, you know, there is nothing wrong with you. I can't say that enough. And if you want to improve your quality of life, let's just add some skills. Speaking of skills, in our classes, we teach both interpersonal skills and intrapersonal skills. What is happening inside you and your relationship with yourself. So the nervous system, you know, really should be called the relationship system because it is so formed and founded by relationship. Humans are social, okay? And our nervous systems communicate with each other. We are connected. And in our classes, we want to help both teens and young adults and their parents or caregivers increase and develop their skills in co and self-regulation through the nervous system education, through somatic experiencing. Somatic means body. How do feelings feel in the body and what do those feelings mean and why is it important to pay attention to them as well as calming strategies, you know what can we do when we're stressed and anxious. How can we support ourselves and others with dysregulation so when our nervous system is frankly overloaded sometimes everything is simply too much mental physical emotional stimulation and we need tools or support. And luckily, tools and support are just right at our fingertips as close as the next breath. So with regulation, our bodies find balance in response to safety. And there are several expressions of this safety, the sensational expressions. So the body communicates through sensation. 
we feel softness, ease, less tension, peace, joy, and pleasure. The behavioral expressions of safety are kindness. When we think before we react and we choose nourishing habits and addictions become obsolete. And then physical expressions are, our chest is open, our shoulders relax, eye contact can become easier. Our body stretches and moves more intuitively doing what the body wants to do. Our facial muscles relax and our posture improves. So when we are under threat, you know, perceived or real threat, we have a sympathetic response using the four F's, fight or flight or freeze or fawn, okay? The body wants to survive, like that's the job of the body. And so we have these different physiological responses that happen, increased heart rate, constricted blood vessels, a slowed breathing, or even holding our breath, and our blood pressure can raise or lower depending on the response that our body has decided is the right response in the moment. What we want to do is, is stretch out those instances of the parasympathetic response, which is that rest and digest. Our heart rate slows. We have a sustainable energy flow. It's restorative. And always this response will be interrupted by sympathetic responses. It'll go like this, you know, up and down throughout the day. We want it to be slower and more sustained in that calm and relaxed place. Okay. And as this is a parent mediated program, we teach that co-regulation is the strongest safety cue. And parents are the models for this. You know, parents go first. We regulate first, we apologize first, we take responsibility first, we reconnect and repair after rupture first. So these are the questions that we ask at the beginning of class. We need to operationally define our terms. What is a friend? How do you know when you have a friend? What do friends have in common? And what is a best friend? So the kinds of answers that we get to these questions, what is a friend? Well, you know, it's somebody that you enjoy spending time with. It's someone that, you know, like is kind to you, likes the same things as you. Um, how do you know when you have a friend? Well, there are signs that people give us when they are our friends. And, you know, mostly it is that reciprocity of care and concern and contact. Friends share common interests. Friendships are based on common interests. That's how, you know, so that's what friends have in common. And what is a best friend? You know, that best friend is that person that you can tell anything to that you can go to in times of joy and celebration, as well as in times of like stress and sadness, and they will have your back, right? They're like also known as your ride or die. So as I mentioned, friendships are based on common interests. And these are the characteristics of friendships. So kindness, you know, we want to be friends with someone who is kind to us, is nice to us someone who is caring who cares about us and our well-being someone who is supportive who supports our endeavors who supports our dreams and someone with whom we have a mutual understanding you know we get each other we want to be friends with someone who's committed to the friendship someone who's committed to the relationship who is loyal and honest you know we say like someone who has your back and someone who is gonna you know, tell you the truth, even if it's painful sometimes. We want to be friends with people we can trust. If we don't have trust, we're going to have a really big problem. Equality is really important in friendships. You know, there's no one person who is, who dominates the other and who controls the other. It's equal. You want to be able to self-disclose. That means you want to be able to share things that are personal to be vulnerable and you want to be able to resolve conflict 
with a friend. Sometimes our learners, they think, well, you know, we're, we are, um, we're friends and then we get in a fight and now we're not friends anymore. Well, not necessarily. You can use skills to resolve the conflict and sometimes you become even closer after that happens so what are the different types of friendships we hear um you know online friends we hear best friends but there's some in between there too and let's check out those different types of friendships so we have online friends and given the pandemic um, a lot of people have established friendships online. The problem with online friendships is that sometimes people aren't who they say they are online. So you do have to be careful. Acquaintances are people who like you maybe know their name, but you don't ever hang out with them. You might know them from work or school, but you don't hang out. Casual friends are people who you might just, you know, hang out with like every now and then, like, you know, two or three times a year, like not very often. And they do have like maybe a few of the characteristics of a good friend, but like not all of them. And regular friends, they might be part of the same like crowd or clique. Um, they might spend time together fairly often. And do they have all of the characteristics of a good friend? Um, not all of them, but they do have some of them. And then best friends. So best friends, you know, like I said earlier, that's your ride or die. You know, those are the people who have your back um, and are and do have all of the characteristics of a true friend. And if you are struggling to determine what kind of friend someone is it is a good idea to go back and refer to that list of characteristics so we know that conversational skills are not soft skills they are hard skills and they do take practice and we want to know what are some guidelines for having an effective conversation coach sebastian all right i'm gonna take over from here so now that we're clear on the different types of friendships, we need to talk about how to strengthen those friendships and get to know people better. And the way we do that is by talking and trading information. Trading information is what people naturally do when they're having a good conversation. It involves the sharing or exchanging of thoughts, ideas, and interests. The most important goal is to find common interests so that you can find out if there are things you might enjoy talking about or doing together. Now, one of the first rules for trading information is to ask the other person questions. You might ask them about their interests, their hobbies, or what they like to do on the weekend. What are some common questions people might ask? They could ask questions about interests, weekend activities, movies, TV shows, video games, or sports. It's important to ask the other people questions because this is how you discover their interests, hobbies, and likes. And as a result, it helps you find common interests. Another step is to answer our own questions and share something related about ourselves. This includes sharing our own interests, likes, or hobbies. Sometimes the other person will ask you the same questions back, but if they don't, you can answer your own question. It's important because they may not ask you the same question in order to trade information. They need to know a bit about you too. So the most important goal of trading information is to find those common interests. And that's because friendships are built on the foundation of them. These are the things we talk about, and these are the things that we do together. It can also be helpful to find out what people don't like so we can avoid talking about or doing those things together. Another rule is to share the conversation. That means pausing occasionally and giving the other person a chance to ask questions and make comments. That's important because this is how we have a two-way conversation. Sharing the conversation is how we get to know each other better. Otherwise, it's just gonna be one-sided. Lastly, another way to trade information is by asking follow-up questions. These are questions that are on the same topic. It's important we ask these because that's how we get to know more about the person. And if we switch the topic too much, it can throw the other person off and can end up sounding like an interview. 
Next, we're going to go over some social errors in conversation, what they look like in practice. One error is being a conversation hog. That means we don't want to monologue or lecture to the other person and never give them a chance to speak. Let's see what that looks like. Hey, Allison, how was your weekend? It was really good. How was yours? It was really good. Yeah, yeah. I went to go see the new sci-fi movie. Oh, with my I wanted friends, to see and it was that. Where such did you? A good movie. Yeah, we had a great time. Um, Where did and you then see we it? like got like a lot of popcorn and chocolate, mm -hmm. and we had such a good time. Mm -hmm. And after that, we all went to dinner together, and we like went to my favorite pizza place, and we got like the best pizza, and it was huge. It was so big, and I had like half of it. And then after that, we had a sleepover, and we stayed up like all night. And I stayed up the latest. I stayed up to like three in the morning and now I'm like super tired um, and I have so much to do today like I'm gonna go swimming and then after that I'm gonna walk my dog to the park it's like my favorite park by my house and yeah I'm really excited I have a really long day but I'm really tired because um, last night it was yeah I stayed up really really late um, and it was fun so as you saw there Elena was the one talking and the other person seemed like she was being excluded from the conversation. It was a very one-way conversation for Elena and she never really got to learn about the other person. And so, yeah, it was a little, it was imbalanced. Another common social error is being an interviewer. And that's when you ask question after question and never share anything about yourself. Now let's see what that looks like. Allison, how was your weekend? It was really good. How was yours? Fine. What'd you do? And I went to the movies with some friends. Oh yeah? What movie did you see? Um, just the new sci-fi movie. Oh yeah, did you like it? I did. Have you seen it? Where, which movie theater did you go to? Um, just my neighborhood one. Oh, do you go there often? I do. Have you ever been? Who do you usually go with? Just friends. Oh, okay. What do you and your friends do other than go to the movies? Like, go out to eat? Oh, what kind of food do you like to eat? Italian food? Oh, so do you like pizza or pasta? Both. Oh, do you like Chinese food? Sure. Oh yeah, what's your favorite kind of Chinese food? Like, all of it. Okay, what other food do you like? I don't know. Hmm. So, with this one, just like being a conversation hog, it was a very one-way conversation. But this time, it was all about the other person, but she never got to learn about Elena. When you're talking to people, you want to make sure that there's a, a, some kind of even exchange between the two of you where you both equally trade the same amount of information. So just keep that in mind. And one more social error when trading information is getting too personal at first. And that's when we share private thoughts and feelings or asking personal questions that might make the, per the other person unintentionally uncomfortable. And let's see what that looks like. Hey, Allison, how was your weekend? It was really good. How was yours? It was good. What'd you do? And I went to dinner with my mom and stepdad. Oh, your stepdad. Yeah. So your parents are divorced? Yeah. Oh, okay. How old were you when that happened? That must have been hard for you. Um, 12. Yeah, it kind of was. I don't really want to talk about it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just curious. So do you know why? Um, they don't really talk about it. Oh, they didn't really tell you why? No. Okay, well, is that, like, hard for you? Could we just change the subject? Well, I'm just curious, you know. So, like, do you hang out with your mom more or your dad? Um, I really hang out with both of them. Okay. Is that, like, weird? Like, do they fight over you still? No. So, are you, like, closer with your mom or your dad? I like both of them. Okay. Well, do they tell you why? No, we don't talk about it. Okay, well, I'm just curious. Every time I watch that one, I notice that I get a sick feeling in my stomach because I see that the other person is saying, I don't want to talk about it. And Alina keeps violating the boundary. Yes, I was going to say the same thing. It seemed that Elena was unaware or ignoring the boundaries. And yeah, that was throwing the other person off guard. And as you become closer friends, it's definitely okay to get more personal, as long as the both of you are comfortable with that. But when you're first getting to meet someone, like there's only so much a person will tell you because, you know, they got to build that trust and rapport first. 
So in conclusion, just remember not to be a conversation hog, don't be an interviewer, and don't get too personal at first. So now we're going to be looking at a more effective way of trading information. Hey, Allison, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm really good. How was your weekend? It was really nice. How was yours? It was great. I actually went to the movies. Oh, cool. What did you see? I saw that new sci-fi movie. Oh, I've been wanting to see that. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah? Yeah. Have you seen the first one? Um, I did. I saw the first one. I need to see the second one. Yeah, the first one was good, too. Yeah. yeah. Do you think they'll make another one? Um, I hope so. I know, right? I really hope so. Yeah. Did you yeah. read the books at all? I read the first one. Okay. Yeah. I oh, read yeah. all of the books, so I really hope they make a third. Yeah. I really want to read the rest of the books. You should. Yeah. yeah. But you should definitely see the movie. The special okay. effects are so good. I know. They do a really good job. Yeah. All right. So as you saw on that one, it was a much more two-sided conversation and they both shared an even amount of, of information with each other. And Elena also asked follow-up questions, answered her own and the other person's questions and they kept it relevant the whole time. So that's a good reference for when you're first getting to know someone and creating information. And they also shared a common interest exactly and yeah that's a one stepping stone in making a friend is having those common interests together and that keeps the bond stronger all right so now that we know a little bit about how to trade information we need to figure out how to start a conversation with someone knowing how to strike strike up a conversation with someone can be difficult and sometimes people even give the wrong advice about what to do and what do we mean what do i mean by that well, we're often told to go up and say hi, or go up and introduce ourselves. That's not actually how it's done. Imagine what would happen if you went up and randomly said hi, or walked over and said, hi, I'm Sebastian. It would probably throw the other person off. Let's see what that looks like in practice before we go over more effective ways to strike up conversations. Hey, do you ever go roller skating? What? Do you go roller skating? No. Why not? You should go. Okay. It's really fun. I go like every weekend. Sweet. There's this new skate park that just opened up. I'm trying to watch something right now, so... Oh, well, I'm just saying. It's really fun. They have like a student night every Thursday. Cool. You should definitely go. Okay. So, as you saw on this one, that conversation was also very one-sided and Elena seemed to be unaware that the other person was not interested in the conversation. She also didn't introduce herself or anything else outside of focusing on the roller skating. And, you know, <clears throat> um, in keeping with the double empathy problem, like these videos do seem kind of like mismatches, right? Mismatches between neurotypes. I agree. Yes, they're both communicating in a very different way. And yeah, I know it can be very hard to adapt to the way neurotypicals speak, but just having those skills in your back pocket can be a pretty good way to just get through life. And yeah, it, it's helped me a lot, even learning, you know, these skills myself as becoming a coach. And excellent. Coach Sebastian has excellent social skills. Oh, thank you, Coach Mara. All right. Now we'll go over more effective steps for starting conversations. Firstly, when you're considering starting a conversation with someone, it's helpful to show interest in the person by casually looking at them for a second or two, but not staring at them. This shows the person that you're interested in them. Next, as you're casually looking over, it's helpful to use a prop like your cell phone, a game like the Nintendo Switch, or a book to give the appearance that you're focused on some other activity. Why would it be a good idea to use a prop? Because then you don't look like you're staring at them and you also look distracted by something else. And while you're casually and covertly watching the person, you need to find some kind of common interest that you both, both appear to share. It's vital to find those common interests because it gives you something to talk about. And it's also an excuse for starting a conversation. Now, once you've identified the common interest, you're going to want to make a comment, ask a question, or give a compliment pertaining to it. 
This gives you the excuse you need to talk to them. Next, you'll need to trade information about the common interests by asking follow-up questions, answering your own questions, and sharing relevant information about yourself. Why is that important? Because this is how you'll get to know someone better. And after that, you'll need to assess the interest of the person you're trying to talk to. If they don't seem interested in talking to you, should you move on? And the answer to that is yes. And you can tell if someone wants to talk to you by asking yourself the following questions. Are they looking at me? Are they facing me? And are they talking to me? Now, if the conversation is going smoothly and they seem interested in talking to you, the final step for starting a conversation is to introduce yourself if you've never met. And if they don't seem interested, you can just move on and go about your day. Oh my God, I love that song. Yeah, me too. This is the new video that just came out today. No way, I'm dying to see that. Yeah, it's so good. That's awesome. Have you ever seen her in concert? I have. I actually have tickets for her upcoming concert. No way, the one that's coming up in two weeks? Yeah, it's going to be so great. That's so cool. Have you ever seen her perform? No, I wish. I really want to. Oh my gosh, she's amazing in concert. You need to see her. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm Alina. I'm Jordan. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. All right. So in that example, as you saw, they both had that common interest of the um, the artist and they both were able to bond over that and keep the conversation going because of it. And in the future, that could always lead to them having the social opportunities to meet up together if they have another artist that they like and they can go to a concert together. So yeah, when you have a situation like that, make sure to just stay on that common interest and expand on that. and opens up a lot of opportunities for friendship so this is a set of specific skills that we teach and that we practice in class which is to ask a question and we provide the question ask a follow-up question on that topic and then answer your own question because when you answer your own question if for example, the other person hasn't said, you know, what about you and employed that social skill. When you answer your own question, that gives the other person more to go on so you can keep the conversation going. And so in class, for the first couple of weeks of class, we practice using a Jeopardy game, these skills of ask a question, ask a follow-up question, and answer your own question. And, you know, this is practice in a safe place, okay, where you get to be seen and heard and acknowledged and validated and practice these skills with other, with your peers, people who also want to learn these skills. And it is a very, like, inclusive and welcoming environment and like I said, a safe space where you can practice. So a little bit of background about peers. So it was developed um, at UCLA in 2004 by Dr. Elizabeth Logason. She went to like 14 different schools before she graduated high school. And she just became fascinated with the complex world of social skills. Um, the curriculum has been translated into 12 different languages and it is used in 150 countries. There is no other social skills program that has this much evidence behind it. And we teach the peers for teens, adolescents, and for young adults. Um, this is a parent mediated intervention, as I mentioned earlier because most parents want to help their kids. You know, they see their child struggling socially and they don't know how to help because social skills are actually hard to teach and they need like, it needs an intensive approach from a proven curriculum with people who really get it. Our team is speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, learning specialists, mental health providers, um, speech language pathology assistants, and direct support professionals, people who are on the front lines and who love 
working with autistic people and are also neurodivergent ourselves and have kids who are neurodivergent. As I was mentioning, it is there is no other curriculum that has this extensive of an evidence base and it is parent facilitated. Okay, we teach only ecologically valid social skills. That means skills that socially successful people use in real life. And there's been many papers published outside of the US on the effectiveness of this approach of this curriculum and of, you know, doing an intensive model with parent training. That is key. And it's also just smart public policy um, and helps us build a better world. So these are the lessons that teens and young adults will learn conversation skills, starting and joining conversations, um, exiting conversations when you've been rejected, when you've been initially accepted and then rejected, or when you've been fully accepted, but you just have to get going, right? Um, effective use of electronic communication, finding a source of friends that um, can be difficult, but there has never been a better time to make a friend ever. Um, effective use of humor, how to have successful get togethers. Um, we teach four classes on dating etiquette, specifically letting someone know you like them, asking someone on a date, going on a date, and then dating do's and don'ts, which is um, around consent and handling sexual pressure. We teach conflict resolution skills, as well as handling all the different types of bullying. And that is gold because, because the old advice of ignore it, walk away, tell an adult, that doesn't work. You have to have mother, other skills. So we teach the way that we teach is, you know, didactic instruction. You know, we deliver the instruction um, with, you know, concrete guidelines and steps. And again, those ecologically valid social skills are taught. Um, and then we practice. The coaches model the behavior and then give, you know, effective and ineffective demonstrations. And then we open out the breakout rooms for practice with the other class members. There is homework. So the homework um, is to have video chats and a few phone calls with other um, learners to practice the skills. And the parent's role is as social coach, you know? And so you wanna be asking like, well, what was your common interest? What could you do with that information if you were to hang out together? So like bringing that, like those metacognitive skills, thinking about thinking, it helps those skills to generalize in real life. Okay. Um, and there is, we introduce a new topic every week, but there's lots of repetition because that's how you build skills. And, you know, you have access to our whole interdisciplinary team for the whole 16 weeks. Um, you know, don't call me at two o'clock in the morning because I won't answer, but, you know, things come up during the class. It is hard, but you know, there are no shortcuts. And if we want to help our teens and young adults get a leg up with these skills that, you know, that we need more as we get older, so because social demands increase as we get older, they don't decrease. We want to give them as much support as they can get. So the learning continues long after the class has ended. So if you want to find out more, please follow us on social media, um, on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, on LinkedIn. Um, you can go to the website, irlsocialskills.com. You can reach out to me um, via email. Um, and our next classes start um, Monday, April 10th for teens, and then Thursday, April 13th for young adults. We take no more than 12 families per class. I do still have a few spots left. Um, if you can't make that time period, we do have several more classes starting 
in July. So reach out to us, get on, um, you can ask to be added to our email list so that you're always informed of what we have coming up and you'll be getting access to content that is not propaganda, that is actually what autistic people want you to know about them and what actually autistic researchers are adding to the field. Um, Sebastian, can you think of any questions that like people ask about um, our classes? Uh, yeah, I did want to address that um, some autistic people might be concerned that it um, pushes them to mask or be neurotypical. And in my experience, it's actually been very helpful for me. And it doesn't really require me to change who I am so much as it just gives me a few extra skills to just know in case I do talk to a neurotypical. Because when you're talking to an autistic person, it's much easier to just naturally interact with each other. But when you're talking to a neurotypical, it is good to have these little skills that we teach because, yeah, they operate on a completely different wavelength. And it's just good to have. And, um, yeah, so don't... These things are not really like a requirement, like, you know, your life's going to be like awful if you don't do it. You know, you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. And these are just things to just know just in case you are in a situation where you think it's necessary. So yeah. just wanted to put that out there. Nice. Thanks, Coach Sebastian. It is. It's just adding skills. It's not changing who a person is. It's just adding skills. And, you know, and they're context dependent. Oh, okay. You know, it's like code switching, right? Oh, I'm here in this setting. I'm going to use these skills. Oh, I'm here like with my people. I'm going to use other skills. Sometimes parents think like, oh, well, we'll just like, we'll just put our kids in a group with, you know, a bunch of other autistic people and just see what happens. You still need to use skills. You know, you still need to use skills. And and those are the skills of initiating, cultivating, and sustaining relationships. You know, the pandemic taught us that, like, if we don't, you know, do the work of keeping up our friendships and relationships, like, we're not going to have them anymore. And, you know, you get what you give. You get what you give. And if you're not getting what you give, then you need to go back and be like, hmm, what kind of friend is this person? And then, you know, in terms of dating, like, you know, we have young adults who really want to date and, you know, and that's normal and natural, of course, like you want to be, you want to have someone to love, you want to be connected to someone. Um, but how do you be more than friends with someone unless you're friends first, you need to have that foundation. So you can't skip over this step of learning these foundational skills. And yeah, they another can practice. Th oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I was gonna say that um, autistic people often need instruction in a very concrete way, and things like dating can be extremely abstract. And the fact that we teach that kind of stuff in such a concrete way to 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 conceptualize such an abstract concept is really helpful and crucial. And it even helped me a little bit. So, yeah, it, these are just good things to just have. And I think it'll make your life a hell of a lot easier in this neurotypically dominated world. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, we just want, we just want people to be happy and free. And, you know, if you have more skills, that is easier. Right. I agree. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much, Coach Sebastian, and we'll look forward to seeing you this week in class. Thank you. Same to you. Yeah. You have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye.